Before we get into today's video, please consider heading over to www.patreon.com forward slash CAEV, it will be at the bottom of the screen, and consider becoming a patron. I have recently lost my job, so any and all donations and contributions help towards keeping the channel active and the lights on. So please consider heading over there, and I will see you all in the video. Under every single Donald Trump tweet, there is this one person that you just hate to see. He's there everywhere. If you can see the screen, you know who I'm talking about. But he is there every single tweet, every single second. It's like he's there before Donald Trump even hits the tweet button. He's that annoying. But who is this person? Well, the person is Dr. Eugene Gu, a person who sued Trump because Trump blocked him for harassment. He was harassing Trump like he harasses him constantly, but obviously the Supreme Court ruled that Donald Trump can't block even on his personal Twitter account for some strange reason, though Dr. Eugene Gu seems to like blocking every single person. I mean, he won't see this video because I'm blocked. That's how bad it is. Someone who has barely got over 200 followers is blocked because he doesn't like, well, doesn't like being disagreed with. Ironic given who he is, but who is he since he's so prevalent in doing what he does? Well, he has a sort of sordid past. Now, I've always found it interesting he would sit here and anyone who, on the right, basically any conservative who he disagrees with, he will sit there and blast any accusations under the sun against him. Yet, the moment he has accusations shown against him, he believes in innocent until proven guilty. Now, innocent until proven guilty still remains here. I'm taking this all as accusations and nothing has been proven. But here we have a pretty long article detailing some pretty pretty extensive things. So I will go through and of course it has got the uh got the stance and got the perspective of Eugene Gu as well, which I think is I think that's good. They actually went to the person who was accused and asked their perspective on something which is great. But anyway, let's actually get into the article, shall we? Behind one of Twitter's most outspoken justice, uh, so outspoken social justice personalities is a history of abuse. This article is very long, so please bear with me as we go through it. You always remember your very first viral treat. Eugene, uh, Eugene Gu tells me, for him, it was a joke about Betsy DeVos and the Bowling Green Massacre. Shows you who he is right off the bat. Now, Nothing should be off limits when it comes to jokes, but they will often say that anyone who uh, says something uh, uh, supports or jokes about something supports that thing. So, yeah, we'll just do it like that. Yeah, that tweet got 460 likes when he had just 200 followers on Twitter, and it was thrilling, empowering feeling. Now, Gu says it almost feels like when patients get a drug tolerance and you need a larger and larger dose of the same drug to get the uh, same physiological effect. And now that I have uh, that, if one of my friends get 4,000 likes and retweets, it's just business as usual. I'm surprised you actually get anything, given that you block half of Twitter. But there we go. You might recognise Gu from another of, uh, uh, from another of his viral tweets: a photo of himself in hospital scrubs taking a Colin, Ka Colin Kaepernick inspired knee to protest white supremacy. That one got uh, 51,000 retweets and 182,000 likes, and made him an Asian American social justice hero. I mean, Asian. They'll sit there and say about white supremacy and white people being the superior race. Their own words, by the way. They'll sit there and think that white people are superior to every other race. They are the white supremacists they accuse everyone else of being. But they forget that Asians actually out-earn white people in America. So it kind of goes against their entire narrative, if you ask me. Or maybe you've seen his op-eds for Hoff Pose and the or, and the Hill, or his appearance on Democracy uh, Democracy Now. Nope, 
Or maybe you spotted him in Donald, uh, Donald Trump's replies. One of his first... Often one of the first to tell the president what he is doing is wrong. He can... It's not him often sitting there telling Donald Trump what he, he is doing is wrong. It's just disagreeing for the sake of disagreeing. Trump could literally come out tomorrow and tweet, We have found a cure for cancer. And Dr. Eugene Gu will be first to tweet, you've put thousands of Americans out of work, congratulations, you failed, or something to that extent. They will literally sit there and say, or oh, Trump can tweet out, grass is, uh, grass is green, sky is blue, and he will sit there and say, but is it really? And go into some convoluted way of explaining how, yes, it actually is, but it's not as simple as Trump tries to portray it, that sort of thing. But anyway... Yeah, well, maybe you heard about him in a federal lawsuit he joined and won alongside, along with six others against Trump for blocking users on Twitter. Basically saying Trump has doesn't have the same rights as every single other user. Gu had learned a lot about the powerful plot from, uh, how powerful the platform could be. It was a tool that could amplify his voice and politi politics, but, could, but also be a tool for manipulation, used to bully his critics or silence those he abused. Eventually, the same platform that built him up would threaten to be his undoing. The way he tells it, Gu's story began one early morning in April 2016 when the two armed... When two armed US Marshals showed up at his door, he had gotten home from a long night of surgery in the trauma unit and Vanderbilt University Medical Center where he was a surgery resident when he heard the violent banging on his doors. The Marshals waited outside. They didn't need a warrant, they told him. They had a congressional subpoena. I mean, yes, they don't need a warrant if they have a congressional subpoena. I'm not even American and I know that. It just totally fooled me, Goo says. There are words that ordinary everyday people don't really know or have to deal with in their daily lives. But, uh, sorry, before the marshal showed up, he lived an ordinary life. Like many Asians Americans, he told me he focused on the hard work of becoming a doctor. He was a liberal leaning but uninterested in getting involved in messy politics of activism. Then he should have kept his mouth shut. But as it turned out, he started, uh, he'd started during his medical school, had put him in the heart of, uh, a controversial battle. Gu studied babies with uh, congenital heart disease and later those with bilateral renal age and agenesis, uh, babies born without kidneys who have a nearly 100% fertility rate. Uh, he wondered if he could use the uh, use tissue from aborted fetuses to save newborns. The tissue, he reasoned, was going to be classified as biohazardous waste, bio waste and thrown into the incinerator. Anyway, what if it it could save lives instead. So basically, you took a, a potentially deadly substance and tried to use it. No wonder you lost your residency. But anyway, Gu opened a small lab called Ganogen, Ganogen, rather, with a few friends and colleagues. They brought their own equipment, autoclaves rats for experiments, and ordered fetal tissue from a company called Stem Express to implant in rats. Ganogen's uh, operations were ostensibly legal, but in the 2015, the Center for uh, Medical Progress, an anti-abortion anti organization, realized this sensationalist and heavily edited video that claimed that Pan Parenthood employees were stealing baby parts for STEM Express. That wasn't edited. It's actually been proven that that was unedited and showed exactly that, but that's neither here nor there. That's a different topic for a different video. The video alarmed conservatives like Tennessee Congress, uh, Congresswoman Marsha Blackburn, who issued subpoenas to dozens of companies that were using fetal tissue for research, including Ganogen. I mean, that's entirely up to her. It's her state. I think it was an altruistic thing STEM Express was doing, and they were punished for it. The goo says, I mean, if you listen to us here in the U UK, altruism is a bad thing. Yeah. Uh, Acquiring fetal tissue for research is legal as long as it's not for profit. Anti-abortion activists insist that STEM Express was making a profit. STEM Express Chief Executive uh, Kate Dyer told Washington Post, We want to accelerate, accelerate life-saving research. That's just what... It, it's basically... Gu had hoped to publish some of the data he'd collected for Ganogen, but a subpoena effectively silenced him, along with the promising film of fetal tissue research. Not long after Vanderbilt brought Gu into an office 
with the hospital's program director, the director for media relations, lawyers, and all these top level people. Uh, Goose says this meeting took place in April or May of 2016. Vanderbilt says this meeting did not take place, though Goo was consoled, uh, yeah, con counseled repeatedly about the need to assure that his social media activity did not interfere with the primary purpose of his employment. And we've all been there, mate. Trust me. According to Goo, Vanderbilt advised him to speak very little about his research, be very extra careful about journalists, be extra careful even to Democratic Congress people. They suggested that Goo lie low. It didn't take it, so it didn't make any sense to me. Goo said he'd spent his whole life lying low, doing what he was supposed to do. Instead of being praised for his research, he got congressional sub he got a congressional subpoena as punishment. He no longer wanted to stay silent. Based on everything I've learned throughout my life, a study in American history, understanding how the political system works in our country and in a democracy, the only way to safeguard your rights is by speaking out and making your case. So Goo decided to fight back. I mean, fight back against what? Fight back against... Ah... Uh, some of these are really annoying when it comes to this. He divided Vanderbilt and appeared on NPR Science Friday to discuss the subpoena and his research. After Goo's NPR appearance, his tweets started getting more replies and retweets and his follower account grew. He was going to battle his program. He learned that social media would be a powerful weapon in his arsenal. Goo saw Colin Kaepernick and the football players who took the need to protest white supremacy and police brutality. But the thing is, they started doing that on a lie. It all started on a lie. In September 2017, he decided that he would do the same thing, remembering something that happened to him at Vanderbilt a few years ago. It was a very traumatic event, Goo said. In January of 2016, he had been driving to work when a couple in a car flagged him down in the garage. He stopped the car and rolled down his window, unsuspecting. He recalls hearing the couple yell, Hey, slur, you uh, can't effing drive. Goo parked and tried to head to the hospital, but the man from the car followed him, grabbed Goo's name badge and lanyard, almost choking him. Do you have any proof? Seriously, do you have any proof? Because there's nothing there's nothing to say. He followed Goo up nine flights of stairs to the hospital, even pulled Goo's patient files out of his hands. When did he get the patient files into his hands? There was nothing mentioned about him grabbing them from his car, nothing about being handed to him. Just, they appeared. Uh, Goo called the police and they told him that they didn't think the man was dangerous. Uh... There's no evidence of anything, but as we know, Goo likes to extenuate and basically uh, they, uh, blow things out of proportion. In Goo's telling, he was uh, when he demanded they press charges, the cops said that the man could also press charges against Goo for reckless driving. Both men were arrested. The incident stunned Goo. I mean, reckless driving put people into danger. That simply sounds like a case of he said she said not he said he said he said he said and not much else but there we go his voice rises when he recounts it it's beyond preposterous to be given a misdemeanor arrest for being racially and physically attacked attacked in your own hospital where you're not even believed by your own police i mean you have a history of blowing things out of proportion, so they probably think, oh, not this guy again. Uh, but there we go. It reminded, it reminded him of the congressional subpoena, the injustice of it. He was doing research to save the lives of babies, yet has accused of, you was accused of killing them. I mean, they had to die for you to do research on their stem cells. So, yeah. I know it's uh, guilt by association, that sort of thing, but there we go. It was like a bizarro opposite world. He'd never experienced anything like that until he left California for Tennessee, according to Goo. He tried to process the incident through Vanderbilt, but Vanderbilt didn't really care that much internally. This is... This is basically just a long old story of how Goo is a victim of everything. But there we go. Now, however, he has had enough time to process what happens. Besides, a hashtag taken, he was now a hashtag. No shit. 
and a social phenomenon. That afternoon, wearing the same white coat and scrubs I wore on that day, that's what I got to tech. In the same hallway domain, was stalk uh, the man was stalking me, he explains. He stopped one of the nurses walking past, knelt down, raised a fist and smiled for his photo. He basically did it for social media clout. That is literally what he's saying. As Goo recounts in an email, an African American nurse passing by took the photo of me and raised her fist in solidarity when she saw me take a knee and I raised my fist too. That's why I, I'm smiling in the photo because we both smiled when we did that gesture. Yes, you're smiling about Sir Virtue signaling. That there's been a reason why people do this and people have posited this reason. That people do this sort of thing because it gives them sort of like a warm feeling and social media brownie points. That they live for social media brownie points. As he said in the beginning himself, you if you have it once, you want more and you want more and more and more and it's never enough. That's why he goes and does what he does to Trump. And that's why he continuously replies to Trump like he does. Because it gives him the likes and the retweets and the followers that he craves. The attention that he wants that is why he does it not for any social justice reason he does it because he wants the attention according to goo not long after he posted the photo a patient's mum started making aggressive facebook posts about him using derogatory names and pretty um pretty racially tinged language when she finally met him at the hospital she asked him to leave the room suggesting that his political beliefs made him unfit to treat her son that is her choice and that is her wishes and that is her right she has every right to do that if she does not disagree if she does not agree with what you do she can ask you to leave but there we go weeks later vanderbilt placed goo under suspension citing performance issues vanderbilt also stated that it would continue to an investigation into goo's personal safety and the safety of other employees goo says a vomc called the suspension non-punitive he wondered how could it be anything else because it's not. There we go. The battle was on. Goo posted excerpts from the letter from v, uh, VUMC about his probation on Twitter. Something you're not allowed to do. I found that out the hard way. According to Goo, the medical centre asked him to clarify that his views on Twitter were his own and not those of Vanderbilt. They also they also pinned the tweet up, first taking Goo directly and then deleting his handle from Twitter, reiterating their social media policies. According to uh, VUMC, Goo was never instructed to edit or modify the substantive content of his social media activity. On Twitter, Goo called that bullying. They're trying to suppress me so hard and ruin my career. No. They're basically, adv they're basically telling you what their social media policies are. I wish I had been informed of that when I started working where I used to work. They didn't inform me of that. You would have been, especially in a high profile case like that. Uh, he tells me, the drama not only unfolded on Twitter, but was widely reported in media outlets from BuzzFeed News and USA Today, which will trade uh, Goo as a victim and hero. Neither, he's neither. After months of Uncertainty on July 1st, 2018, Vanderbilt ended Goo's resident residency contract, denying that the termination had anything to do with his activism in a publicly posted letter. VUMC wrote, our administration, faculty and residency pro uh, program leaders have shown a consistent committed uh, commitment to the principles of diversity, integrity and fairness, and will continue to adhere to these principles even when unfairly and falsely accused of not doing so. The letter strikes a defensive un uh, tone to me reading it now. To me, it almost sounds as if Goo wasn't the one who had been wronged by VUMC, but somehow that things might have been the other way around. And there we go. I spoke to Dr. Miauskis, whoever that is, over the phone not long after uh, after news about uh, Vanderbilt came out. Alison, her name has been changed to protect her identity, is a 30 to you, a 30 year old medical student in a middle of nowhere town with within driving distance of Tennessee. Her voice is bright, a little chirpy. Allison began turning to Twitter as an outlet for the stresses of medical school. She quickly became a part of the hashtag med Twitter world where the doctors and medical students discuss their work and earnest questions or office sorry, offer advice or tweet medical puns and jokes. Allison liked to Post funny candid anecdotes from my life, detailing a date with a cardiologist, which hashtag med Twitter compared to watching Grey's Anatomy, or talking about her struggles with her studies. One day around December 2016, she got a DM from Goo telling her that he was impressed by how open she was on Twitter. 
It was months before Goo would become Twitter famous for his kneeling photo, Allison had been impressed by his credentials. A surgeon who had gone to Stanford and Duke and uh, thought he looked cute in his pictures. No. Their conversation turned from DMs to texts which turned into phone calls. In the beginning, Allison says Goo was charming. They talked about Marsha Blackburn and when Goo talked about his research, he told her how much respect he had for the women who donated the aborted fetuses. When he talked about that, he was a very impressive man, Alison says. They spent hours on the phone. Goo called me a lot. Even when he was at work, Alison said, he spent 15-20 minutes standing in a stairwell. I thought that was cute. Basically, not doing his job, which kind of goes into why they got rid of him. For, what's the word they were doing here? They're basically saying that, yeah, citing performance issues. They cited performance issues as the reason why they put him under investigations. And when they came here, uh, he'd spend 15 to 20 minutes in a stairwell. They talked about other things too, but uh, I don't care. Uh, like their views on marriage and children, and they talked about Twitter. Alison gave good tips on how to get more followers. You can make a hashtag about something that's trending, and then jump in the conversation. She remembered when Goo tried out, uh, out the strategy for the first time, how happy what he was that it worked. He told Alison that they could become Twitter's hashtag uh, power couple. But the thing is, even she says there that they he was spending more time talking to her than doing his work. And that's what they decided to suspend him over was his performance issues finally goo invited allison to visit him in nashville for valentine's day in 2017 he promised to show her around the town and let her shadow him at work hell yeah allison said she got lost trying to find his apartment building and then she when she met him she was surprised how different he seemed from the impression he'd made online from his picture, she had imagined him as cute, tall, and confident in person. He seemed mousy and uncertain, and he apologised constantly. Uh, there would be many more disappointments on that visit. It turned out that she couldn't actually shadow Goo at work since he'd forgotten to get permission from his program. And when they went out to lunch, he'd often, he was often on his phone focusing more on Twitter than me, asking me to retweet stuff. Uh, he spoke about how much he wanted to get revenge on Vanderbilt through his Twitter following. His apartment was a mattress on the floor and a dining room table. He was like, well, okay, that's a, how a big surgeon lives, a big time surgeon lives, she says. They took a snap and when she woke up, he, uh, he was already between her legs putting a condom on. It was, o it was over as soon as it began. I didn't have time to think about it. Uh, I guess we kind of said we're seeing each other. I was a little upset about it. Alison says, I wasn't really sure I wanted to have sex with him. But then again, she reasoned she couldn't feel too upset. She'd already agreed to come to Tennessee as a date after all. The next few days, Goo left her alone while he went to work. She went to uh, the Whole Foods near his apartment, bought him snacks and, pot and pineapple, his favourite fruit. She was looking forward to Valentine's Day when Goo promised to go on a real date. But when that date came, they were interrupted again by his feud with Vanderbilt. Uh, Goo's advisor asked him to come in for a meeting when they told him that he could, uh, couldn't could speak badly about VUMC online. He got really angry, Alison says. When he eventually calmed down, they went to a local pizza place for their romantic date. Uh, you're the only person in the world I can talk to, Goo told her. If it wasn't for you, I might have ki uh, done that. This video will get flagged if I say it, so yeah. Back at Goo's apartment, he started pawning at her uh, while she would, uh, while she tried to refuse. Sorry, pawing at her. Uh, she tried to push him away. He kept at it. It was like he, uh, like that until he passed out. That's when I got up, turned on the shower, and was crying. And here it is. Uh, just a friendly reminder: Trump's MAGA hat and the apparel is not made in America, USA. They're made in China. That is indeed false. They were knockoffs made in China made to look like he didn't make it make him in America the only official Trump gear is made in America but that's neither here nor there and then there was Mary uh, Mary Laurie MD had introduced herself to Allison on Twitter even before Allison had met Goo in person she didn't think anything unusual of their conversation after all Allison had talked to other female doctors on Twitter many of whom turned out in, uh, turned into real life friends 
that her conversations with Mary took strange turns, especially after, Valent after the Valentine's Day visit. Mary often talked about Goo. I follow Goo because I saw him on the news, she'd say, and I think he's hot, and I've never had sex with an Asian guy before. Mary said that uh, she printed out Goo's picture and posted it on her wall. I make sure I retweet him all the time so he notices me, Mary says. Mary said, he's retweeting you a lot. Are you dating him? That seems a bit stalkerish if you ask me, but okay. Uh, Alison told her no, even if Goo called her baby over text, they weren't officially in a relationship. I was scared that if I told Mary we were dating, she would go psycho. I mean, that is a fair assessment. She did seem a bit unstable, but there we go. Uh, she seemed creepy, like she would get aggressive and post it all over the timeline and dox me. Mary's, Mary's messages were making Alison nervous. When she brought the DMs to Goo, he quickly dismissed it. He told her that many people wrote to him on Twitter, but Alison was the only one he talked to. Alison's contact with Goo slowly tapered off in the months after they met. Eventually, Alison muted Goo's account. She thought he would notice if uh, she unfollowed him and didn't want to risk it. Eventually, Mary's messages start, uh, stopped coming too. Then in July 2018, after controversial struck hashtag MedTwitter, with Mary at the heart of it, she accused an account called Dr. Uh, Glaucom Flecken, whatever, of donning blackface. Dr. whatever, Avatar, was an of a scope dressed in a top hat, cartoonized moustache and a goatee. These are medical words, I have no idea what they mean, so, or not what they mean, or how you say them, so I'm not even going to attempt to, because I could end up saying something bad, so I'll just leave it at that. Uh, uh, one could potentially interpret it as blackface or seen as it personified accurate representation of a black medical instrument. Alison thought it was ridiculous. She had been following Dr. Glacomfecken, whatever, for a while, and he never said anything that uh, mean about anyone. After Alison saw that Goo had retweeted Mary, she decided to call out Mary's bizarre accusation. Her spotlight on Mary drew others' attention too. While Alison was out on her, fr out, her friends texted her, Did you see that people were saying Mary is actually Goo on Twitter? Alison freaked out. Then she saw the growing evidence. Ma uh, Mary posted Twitters that were actually Goo's and posted things about Vanderbilt that no one other than Goo would have known. The hospital where Mary claimed she worked didn't list a doctor under her name. When Alison finally tweeted at Goo to stop tweeting as Mary, the account was immediately deleted. Though, uh, sorry, that was enough evidence for me, Alison says. Uh, this Mary character who I've met would have loved this controversy. Uh, she would have loved the chance to defend his honour. Before I spoke to Alison, I had noticed unsettling tweets from Mary Law, uh, Laurie's profile too. I was writing on a profile on Goo, sorry, writing a profile on Goo, and had been trying to get in touch with some of his critics. Though I agreed with Goo's left-leaning political views, it was clear most media coverage of him was one, very one-sided. They only told Goo's story, the one that made him out to be a victim and a hero. I tweeted at an uh, Especially ardent critic now deleted Nefarious MD, asking for his perspective on Goo. Nefarious MD posted screenshots of unsettling piece of Goo's past, a series of arrest citations, including filled out restraining orders and allegations of domestic violence. It came, I'd come across the allegations early in my research and asked Goo about it in our interviews. Goo told me that the charges of the filings were expunged. The labelling of these sounds, uh, these things sound terrible. He said, "You could, uh, you can't use family law court filings to get dismissed by a judge as evidence of wrongdoing, but you can paint a really bad picture about someone." He said the citations were tactics of an overly aggressive lawyer, and that it wasn't fair to bring his ex-wife into the story. I mean, that is that is very fair. It's not fair to bring someone who's not in any of the any of it into it because they might not want to be there so yeah I agree it's not fair to actually put them into there but yeah at the time I agreed but still something don't uh, gnawed at me something that I didn't uh, didn't feel quite right maybe it was how easily goose uh, sounded indignant in indignant indignant during our interviews or the tense charge terms he used to describe the alleged discrimination he suffered or how in every narrative he was always the victim. 
A day after I tweeted at NefariousMD, I got a surprising email from Goo. If you do a story with NefariousMD's input, it would be a gross miscarriage of journalistic integrity and ethics. No, it's actually the what a journalist should do, get every single side of a story and let people decide for themselves. Yeah, Goo wrote, and any allegations of domestic violence were completely unwarranted. Please know that any publication insinuating that I committed any acts of domestic Domestic violence will be met by a libel and defamation suit. He emphasised again that there were no court records for the arrest charges and criminal records in the screenshots often shared online, which meant they, uh, which meant they had been expunged by a judge. The tone of his email was completely different from any of our prior interactions. The email seemed unwarranted, excessive. I looked back at Nefarious MD's tweets, trying to understand what would unnerve Goo so much that he would try to stop me from even having a conversation. Aside from posting a domestic violence screenshots, Nefarious MD also tweeted about Goo's sock puppet accounts, including Mary Laurie MD. I'd noticed Mary's account before, but it seemed and it hadn't seemed remarkable. There were tweets about social justice issues and retweets of other physician activists, but her replies to Nefarious MD took a very different tone. She spoke as if she knew Nefarious MD personally, implied that he was a fellow resident in Goo's residency program and alleged that he was responsible for a patient's death in increasingly graphic terms. The public demands to know why Nefarious ND got away with ramming a, a central line into a patient's cartoid artery, killing the patient with a massive stroke. If uh, Is this standard of care at Vanderbilt? Why is a white resident like Nefarious ND held to, different, held to a different standard? I mean, there was no proof Nefarious ND was even white, but there we go. Of course, sorry, in the course of one day, June 8th, I encountered over 60 tweets directed at or related to Nefarious ND in intense graphic language. Finally, Mary went even further, posting a photo of a patient in a hospital bed. Body bare on the operating table, lines and tubes inserted into his chest. Perhaps the same patient she alleged that Nefarious ND had killed. The tweets were disturbing, the photo was shocking, even the Ferris MD had been racist at work, even if he had been responsible for a patient's death, I couldn't imagine what it'd be like to be consistently rem reminded of your mistake, to see a, face, a photo of a patient you lost posted in a public forum. I mean, something like that can seriously damage someone. I mean, you'll sit there and say that someone doing this work is... They're trying to help people, but they will make mistakes. Mistakes happen in every single line of work. Even if you say, like, work in a shopping centre and you drop something, that is a mistake at work. Granted, these people have a higher standard when it comes to these sort of things, and their mistakes can often result in the death of another person. Sometimes it's just not their mistake, uh, not their fault. Mistakes happen. It's just the world we live in. We're human. Humans make mistakes. Days after Mary posted the photo, a Nefarious MD's Twitter account was deleted. I take it they didn't want to be there anymore. Mary Laurie's account was bizarre, aggressive and confrontational, unlike Goo's, and wanted to understand what exactly Goo was trying to do with Mary's account. Did it exist to torment other users, defend himself from perceived attackers? Could he have been doing it for fun? Po uh, for possible answers, I spoke to Whitney Phillips, an assistant professor in communication, culture and digital technologies at Syracuse University and author of a book on online trolls. According to Phillips, Goo's alter ego account made perfect sense for someone with a high profile. In some ways, Phillips tells me it sounds like a brand, like brown, man uh, brand management. Jesus Christ, I can't speak tonight. Goo had it had built a popular persona as a staunch progressive, a social justice ad ad activist. He'd got an extensive positive press coverage on his story, the hard-working Asian-American doctor attacked by conservatives. He's not attacked by conservatives. People disagree with him and he blocks them. By his own medical program for daring to stand up against racism, by cordoning off his positive, uh, positive account from the mere antagonistic account, it allows the media coverage to be more universally beneficial to his narrative and his brand. Philip says the fake account, meanwhile, was a way for Goo to freely ret uh, retaliate against critics without harming the identity he had so carefully built up. Imagine using a sock puppet to get your views across. <sighs> 
It's much harder to pinpoint why he might have felt the need to be hostile at all. My work was deliberately sidestepped. Uh, so psychological profiling question, Philip says. In many cases, we just don't have access to people's inner emotional ecosystems. Even if we do, people are, very, are really busy trying to manage their public perception. There's a very high likelihood that someone accused of problematic behaviour is going to downplay it or lie. Phillips believes that the performative element of social media that most influences people uh, summons decisions and behaviours. People's behaviour online tends to uh, correlate to a group norm. If the perf uh, performative expectation in Gu's mind is that he needs to behave in this highly progressive staunch social justice orientation, of course that's how he's going to behave. But on uh, Mary Lloyd's account, Gu was free, and while Gu's case may seem extreme, Brand management is something that everyone does online or off. It stems, after all, from the same basic, hu basic human desire as social creatures. We want to be accepted and loved. And the way Goo became obsessed with Twitter, his Twitter following brought it up often in his online offline life. Imagined it as a tool of revenge. Perhaps it was wasn't so far fetched either. According to Phillips, Goo was using social media in exactly the way it was designed to be used. Twitter and Facebook aren't incentivizing restraint after all, they incentivize communication and exaggeration. The more, the better. That is false. They do punish uh, uh, people who don't restrain themselves. I know better than anyone. I mean to my 30s, if not higher, account because I don't show restraint. Though, that's because I don't uh, have the same politics as these kinds of people. Let's put it this way, if Goo had my politics he would have been gone long ago. <laughs> but there we go. Uh, Goo's case was a grotesque extension of how a lot of people use the sites and are encouraged to use these sites by the, uh, the sites themselves. Stop saying sites. Uh, these companies make money off of convincing people that social media engagement is a validation of a person's worth that our sense of self-worth and who we are and why we matter is tethered to quantitative metrics and that can go to a very ugly place very quickly. Alison had told me that she didn't want to go public with what happened between her and Goo. He was supporting Goo causing and she didn't want to take anything away from that. But discovering the Mary Laurie account pushed her over the edge in July 20, uh, 2017. Uh, she tweeted, I'm freaking out right now knowing my ex-boyfriend was tormenting me with a fake female account. Sending, to D, uh, sending me DMs obsessing over him, asking intimate details about his sex life, and then trying to convince me they slept together. I'm going to be sick. I remember that tweet very well. Uh, she described a man obsessed with his Twitter following a date that turned into something resembling sexual assault. He is on top of me, groping me, trying to kiss me as I keep trying to get up and telling him, him no. Moving my face away from his kisses, he kept saying he wanted to have unprotected sex so that he could get me pregnant so I could never leave him. I continued to fight him off in, until eventually he tired himself out and passed out. For a while before I spoke to Alison, I debated about whether to write this story too. Even if Gu had a shadow, a shadow side, even if he had his unresolved questions from his past, he had experience for uh, racism in his residency program and he was starting conversations that were important. As they say, this is how these people do it. They'll sit there and say, well, I've experienced racism. So they'll try to put that as some sort of, well, I can do no bad. And you questioning, questioning me is making me a victim again. But there we go. But while it, uh, maybe it was just unfair to erase the complications. Maybe Goo could be both a victim and entitled by his role as a victim. Not long after Alison's tweets went viral, Goo posted his own account of what happened between the two of them on Twitter. In his version, Alison was the seducer and that he was the unwilling victim. He is always a victim. Alison's allegations are 100% em empathetically false, he said. He denied many details from the Valentine's Day meeting, including the fact that he went in for a meeting with Vanderbilt. He sent a sexually explicit voicemail and a drunk voicemail that he allegedly received from Alison months after the Nashville visit as evidence of his innocence. On Twitter, he claimed that Mary Lloyd's account was an anonymous account people close to me created to address the trolling issues I was encountering from Trump supporters on Twitter. That didn't happen. After a while, I also shared access to this account to help combat the trolls. Goo dis uh, described using the burner account to turn Alison off from me and drive a wedge between us romantically. Later in an email to The Verge, he contradicts this statement. The Mary Lloyd account was, the was originally 
an account meant for my mum to learn how to use Twitter that must be clarified. Again, his story, his, his story is falling apart. Can't keep his story straight, but there we go. On Twitter, Guru ended uh, with a bold statement against sexual assault and harassment. Men can be victimised by women too, and false accusations without due process is a weapon of terror, he wrote. I know public phys- figures are supposed to handle wh- uh, whatever attacks come from our way, but sometimes things are just too much for one for a human being I'll be taking a break from Twitter. <laughs> His Twitter break lasted just 19 days. Yes, men can be victimised by women too, and false accusations without due process is a weapon of terror. But you also supported those when they was against Brett Kavanaugh. And anyone else that's conservative that you disagree with, you will label and use false accusations against. But who am I to sit here and say about it? But Because obviously I, I've spoken out about these obsessively in the past. Well, not obsessively. Obscenely in the past. There we go. Uh, then he was back online, posting familiar tweets about activism. If you read his timeline today, you wouldn't be able to spot any signs of whirlwind with Alison and Mary Laurie. Today he's up to 257,000 followers. This was in 2019. No one barely knows this. And everyone sits there and treats him like he's still some sort of hero. But no, he's not. Sometimes uh, voices in his replies call out his alleged abusive behaviour towards Alison and his ex-wife. But the block button isn't easy to click away, and he still has plenty of supporters. I want it coming from someone who sued Trump about blocking him. But there we go. He still tweets about Vanderbilt's from December 5th. We still uh, we need a full and thorough investigation of a culture of silence and zero accountability in medicine. But he also posts photos of himself with a happy-looking new part of accounts of two of them watching Miyazaki movies together and sometimes what sounds like a softer approach to activism. We all have an innate des- uh, desire for violence, bullying and revenge hardwired to our limbic system. He tweeted on January 4th, left unchecked we can behave just like animals to each other but as human beings we have a neocortex that allows us to show compassion, forgiveness and mutual understanding. Something that you don't have towards Trump. And there we go. And another time it never hu- it, hu- it never hurts to be a little more kind even to our enemies. I want it coming from you, but there we go. And another, anything can go viral these days as long as they are sensational enough. But the difference between fake news and the truth is that the truth lasts until the end and never goes away. Lies lies vanish under the scrutiny of time and investigation. You mean like Russia, something that you push yourself. But there we have it. This wasn't exactly anything to just basically attack the guy. It's me just basically putting out there that Whenever you see Eugene Gu, just know he's, he's a hypocrite. He'll sit there and do something that he accuses others of doing, something he doesn't like being done against himself, and will sit there and pub and push a false narrative against Trump. He is one of Trump's most notorious reply guys, and I don't think that will account and that will end any time soon unless his account is removed from Twitter. But Twitter won't do that because Twitter agrees with him empirically and 100%. They must do, otherwise, why would they keep his account on Twitter? But there we have it. Anyway, let me know what you guys think in the comment section down below. This video, I do apologise for it being so long, but it is what it is. Anyway, I'll see you all in the next video. Bye for now.